Good morning and welcome to the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance Workshop. I'm David Linky, the Manager Director of EdGrowth. Right up front, I'm going to say that I have a significant working from home challenge today. So there is a jackhammer on the other side of that wall. So at some point you may hear more jackhammer than you hear me, but we'll persevere and see how we go. EdGrowth is Australia's education technology and innovation industry hub. Through connection and collaboration, we accelerate Australia's EdTech ecosystem globally. The Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance program has been created to support partnership between Victorian EdTech companies, education institutions, and international organisations to test and promote the efficacy of Victorian EdTech solutions for export growth. The program is being funded by the Victorian government through the International Education Short-Term Recovery Strategy. And we're delighted to be working with Global Victoria to be able to deliver this program. Before we can uh, begin with today's workshop, I'd like us to pause to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuous and unbroken connection to the land, waters and culture across the country. Whilst we are virtually connected, um, we all come from different parts of traditional lands of Australian people. I am personally joining you from the traditional land of the Boonwurrung, Woiwurrung, Woiwurrung and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Now that Jack Hammond has started, so I'm not sure if you can hear me anymore. I extend all our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I specifically add my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present with us today. Today, to view today's full agenda, you can look to the right of your screens and it will show you the agenda will be available all morning so you always know what's happening and where. Um, we are delighted to have a couple of really interesting thought leaders in the education research space. We've got Professor Margaret Beerman from Deakin University and Professor Michael Henderson from Monash, who facilitates today's workshop. It's an interactive session. You'll get a great opportunity to meet with other participants and actually work through this idea of what is edtech efficacy. We're going to break the session into three components, evidence, efficacy, and then finally interpretation. And all of these three components will help you in building a significant program for your business and also submitting an application when we get to that point. Um, there will be three components with each session. We'll begin with a short presentation from Margaret and Michael, followed by 20 minute breakout discussions in the participate rooms on the platform that you're using. And then we'll meet back here to collect all of those thoughts together and put together those ideas into a communal tool called Padlet. The format will be repeated across the workshop theme. There'll be breaks for people to be able to go and do things that always have to happen in life whilst you're working from home. Um, we'll then share an overview of the entire Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance program and tell you how you can participate and give you some insights to the application process. The Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance program is only possible due to the support of the Victorian government. Fiona Litos, Director of International Education for Global Victoria, is here to help us set the scene. Fiona um, leads Global Victoria support international education business and providers to diversify global markets and products and maintain Victoria's position as a destination of choice for students, including through innovative student initiatives and the Study Melbourne brand. Thanks very much for the support, Fiona, and welcome along today. Thank you so much, David, and good morning, everyone. My name is Fiona Litas. Um, as David said, I'm the Director of International Education and Study Melbourne at Global Victoria. And uh, I would like to acknowledge Professors Beverly Oliver, uh, Margaret Beerman, and Michael Henderson, and extend a very warm welcome to all of you here today from Victorian education providers and EdTech companies. And I'm so pleased to be here with you today for the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance Workshop. Last November, the Victorian government launched the um, International Education Short-Term Recovery Plan. That was a $33.4 million commitment. Uh, and that short-term plan uh, had uh, boosted supports uh, to help stimulate and support the international education sector during this protracted and incredibly challenging time. Uh, and of this funding, $3.6 million uh, was allocated for the International Research Partnership Program. Now, the EdTech Innovation Alliance is one of two key initiatives under this program. Uh, and that's, of course, in recognition of uh, the critical importance of Victoria's edtech sector in responding innovatively to the rapidly changing needs and demands of learners globally. 
So we're, of course, thrilled to be partnering with EduGrowth to deliver the EdTech Innovation Alliance. And this initiative builds on a long-standing collaboration between the Victorian Government and EduGrowth, which has helped to build the capability and market reach of our EdTech companies and to help position Victoria as a global EdTech hub. So as a trade facilitation agency, Global Victoria is always seeking new opportunities to support economic resilience and recovery from the pandemic. And we know that the impact of the pandemic on the international education sector and on our students has, of course, been significant. Uh, but through these challenges, we've seen interest and demand for online resources and edtech grow, uh, of course, and that has come with the rapid shift to online learning. In 2020, Victoria's EdTech companies promptly responded to the disruption to education with very creative solutions. Venture capital activity for EdTech is projected to hit US 150 billion over the coming 10 years, with expenditure projected to double to US 404 billion by 2025. Global Victoria sees great opportunity in EdTech and wants to help the sector to capture booming investment and export to global markets. So today, Australia has approximately 600 uh, EdTech companies that provide employment to around 13,000 people and turn over $2.2 billion in annual revenue. And in Victoria, there are approximately uh, 200 Victorian EdTech companies that employ around 4,200 people. So, of course, uh, supporting the EdTech uh, uh, ecosystem ensures that Victoria remains globally competitive, it enables reach and retention of global learners, and of course, it enhances the student academic experience. In this financial year, Global Victoria has delivered virtual trade missions to the US, Latin America, India, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman and Southeast Asia to connect Victorian businesses to global opportunities and to profile Victoria as the home of Australian EdTech. We're also acting to improve the offshore online student experience. And so in March this year, we opened our first Study Melbourne hub in Shanghai. We are set to open two more hubs, one in Kuala Lumpur and another in Ho Chi Minh City very shortly. And these hubs uh, provide support to offshore international students who are studying or looking to study with a Victorian education provider. But the hubs are also intended as a place to connect investors, edtech companies, education providers and researchers to export and invest in Victoria's edtech capabilities. Which brings me back to this workshop. So, of course, this initiative is about supporting Victorian education providers and edtech companies to build capability and competitive advantage offshore. So we hope to grow and diversify market access to research, research partners and funding to help export new edtech products and to strengthen Victoria's global reputation for edtech, research and innovation. So the EdTech Innovation Alliance will provide grants and deliver capacity building activities to support collaborations between EdTech companies, researchers and international partners. And these grants will enable efficacy research to road test Victorian EdTech products ready for export. So we're looking for projects that can demonstrate strong alignment with your organisation's international engagement strategy. Uh, and we're also uh, seeking a mix of initiatives and collaborations across institutions, edtech companies and international education markets. And ultimately, the program aims to help edtech companies and Victorian education providers to grow their, the presence in the Victorian economy, to gain market access, to improve rankings and, of course, in the longer term, to attract students and talent to Victoria, uh, but also to increase reach and awareness of Victoria's strengths in education, edtech and research. Uh, so we also want to let you know that we're organising an online education roundtable very shortly, uh, likely to be next week, so stay tuned, stay tuned for further details. Uh, and this roundtable will bring together uh, representatives from Victorian education providers and edtech companies. Uh, and that roundtable will aim to discuss practical solutions to boost Victoria's online delivery to students overseas. Uh, and finally, just wanted to remind you, of course, of our extensive network of in-country education service managers. Uh, they work in our key education markets and they're embedded in our Victorian Government Trade and Investment Network. Uh, our ESMs are always a really great resource for you to draw on. They're very happy to facilitate collaborations and market access and introductions. So please do reach out to them if you need any in-country support. Uh, so thank you again for your interest and your participation in today's workshop. We look forward to your participation uh, and, uh, and a, a really terrific discussion. And I will now hand you back to David. Thank you, David.
Thanks very much, Fiona. And again, thank you greatly for the ongoing support of the sector. It's uh, really well uh, well received, so thank you. you. Um, now I'd like to welcome Emeritus Professor Beverly Oliver, who is a higher education consultant, speaker, and researcher focused on digital education, micro-credentials, curriculum transformation, and quality assurance, and graduate employability to give us a little bit of context setting. And Beverly is actually a director of Edge Growth and also is chairing the project governance group for the EdTech Innovation Alliance. Welcome, Beverly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here. And uh, it's wonderful hearing all that information from Fiona. This is terrific because uh, I've spent my life as an educator, as many of you may have. And um, I guess years ago, I used to think that whatever institution I belong to, be it a university or even a secondary school in my earlier life, I thought that we could do the whole thing ourselves and that's what we should do. I changed my mind about that sometime uh, during my time at Deakin when I realised that actually what we need to make education really work is we need an ecosystem. And it was particularly clear to me on one particular day when I went to a meeting in Sydney with members of the government and from Austrade actually, where there were some ed tech innovators in the room. I think I was the only university person in the room and I heard a lot of people talking about all their great ideas and their bright shining solutions and examples in ed tech but they also said, but when it comes to working with an institution like a university, it's really hard because we cannot find the right door to knock on. And I thought, gee, what a, what a missed opportunity. Because as a person working in a university, I knew what the challenges were that we had. And I know there are a lot of people out there making up very good, bright, shiny solutions, but surely we could find a better way for the problems to meet the solutions. And of course, it's not always problems, but education is a very human industry. It's never perfect, it's never done. And so we need all of us to work together, I think, in order to be able to make the best possible outcome available to learners, no matter where they are on the lifespan, whether it's early childhood education, K to 12, post-secondary, post-university, post-TAFE, post-VET to the working life and onwards. And I think that's one of the great challenges that we're currently facing. I'm also sitting here just thinking, gee, you know, I know COVID's been terrible and still is for many of us, but before COVID, I was completely unaware of platforms like this that actually make the experience really high production value quality and isn't that a great innovation that we've all experienced? And I'm also wondering whether we will ever go back to having a fully non-hybrid physical, I'm sure we will have some of those events, but isn't this a great way for us all to be able to be more accessible and to actually avail ourselves of educational opportunities like today's workshop? And that can really apply right across the spectrum. So I guess, in my opening remarks, what I would like to refer to is how we need to work as an ecosystem. None of us has all the answers. Some of us work in institutions, some of us work in businesses. What's good for education is good for business and what's good for business is good for education. And I think what we need to do is continually work to make those two work together so that we can actually have a more prosperous, healthier, happier, community and we're certainly looking forward to that as well. So I wish everyone well and I'll be really in, uh, watching and enjoying the uh, workshop today and hope to check in regularly during the project. It's wonderful to have Global Vic supporting this great uh, opportunity and I thank you and wish you well. Thanks David, back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Beverly, and I agree 100% with you. A connection across a collaboration is really absolutely essential, and you've been integral with helping Edge Growth get to that uh, thinking pattern. So thanks very much for your ongoing support. So now we can jump into our first session, which is entitled Evidence, I think. So um, we've got two fantastic facilitators who are going to do this work right now. So we've got um, Professor Margaret Beerman, who is a researcher within the Centre of 
Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning Cradle at Deakin University and over the course of career, career has been researching higher education and actually I think start in clinical education. We've got Professor Michael um, Henderson from the Digital Futures at the Facility of Education at Monash University. He's a leading expert in the field of digital education, in particular the effective use of technology in the internet enabled teaching and learning. So welcome Michael and Margaret. Hi Margaret. Got you both fantastic. Um, I'll hand over to you. The, the the floor, the digital floor is yours. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I'm I'm going to probably uh, take the lion's share of this uh, initial step. But it's um, uh, Margaret. Did you did you want to add any uh, comments before I kick off? Um, the only thing I wanted to say is this is a workshop, so we are expecting you to um, work. I hope you don't mind. So there'll be a lot of small group work and all that kind of thing in today's session. So a little of us and hopefully a lot of you. Fantastic. Great. So Sarah, can you um, share the, share my screen, I suppose, is the, is the next step? Fantastic. Thank you. So there's some contact details for us if you want to do any follow up uh, questions with Marg and I. Um, but what we might do is kick on straight away and, and point out that the goal of these workshops is really to be playful. What we're really after is to explore a broad understanding of evidence, efficacy and interpretation in the evaluation of education technologies. So we hope you're going to uh, embark on this with a degree of playfulness with us. Now, this morning we're going to engage in three discussions uh, around evidence, efficacy and interpretation. We'll kick off each with a provocation and the idea of a provocation here is not to <laughs> anger or be argumentative, but really just to stimulate discussion. Okay, and the, one of the things we need to really uh, point out is that we recognise the wealth of knowledge in this room and the diversity of interests and the fact that everyone in this room is clearly successful already in their education uh, entrepreneurialism by simply the fact that you're here, you've been selected to be here. So we're not uh, wanting to talk down or talk across, we're hoping to just inspire uh, a moment of a conversation. In fact, what we really want to do is make the familiar strange and be playful with perspective. So this is not a masterclass in research. And I have to be really clear about that. We're purposely adopting a general kind of language that's hopefully accessible to everyone and it's designed to stimulate discussion rather than pursue a particular research tradition. And we recognize that in this room, there are also a number of experienced researchers and we invite you to be playful with the framing as well. The point is we don't want to lecture at you um, about something that you're already familiar or engaged with, but rather give you the opportunity to slow down, ponder, and explore insights that might arise from the provocations, but particularly as you move into discussions with your fellow entrepreneurs and innovators. And we think that that is a real uh, value point of this moment. So this first uh, workshop, we're going to focus on this notion of evidence. In other words, how do we know something is working? What do we mean by terms like effect, outcome and impact? What we're going to do is have a short provocation around evidence for about 10 minutes. There's going to be about a 20 minute discussion uh, where you're going to be broken up into small groups. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to articulate and, and elicit from each other notions of what kind of data, what kind of effects you're looking for and how to make that a compelling story. And then we're going to come back together to, to tap into any key insights or questions you might have. So first of all, broadly, evidence, when we're talking about it, it's really about building a compelling case and that can look so very different depending on the context. What we can start to think about is the scope of the claim, which is which is a, a critical component of, of any uh, case building. And here we're going to talk about effect, outcome and impact. And that's where I really want to focus uh, this conversation here. But we can also talk about the nature of the data itself that supports the claim and the method of data collection and analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later on this morning. So sorry for the busy screen, um, but I figured uh, this is something that we can share and sometimes it's useful to have more notes on the page than not when you're sharing after the fact. So here 
what I want to do is, is have this framing, which some of you in this room might have a different way of approaching this, but this is um, something that I've found quite useful when working with innovations in education, whether you're looking at uh, trying to impact on teaching, on learning or administration processes, services. Um, and it's this idea of effects, outcomes and impact. So effects are the changes that may occur because of the innovation or the intervention. And here, um, it, it then leads into this notion of the outcomes, which are the, the specific and measurable effects, but in relation to the predefined objectives. So have you achieved those objectives and, and how do you know that? So what effects are you drawing on to demonstrate that you've achieved your, your um, objectives? And then that leads into this notion of impact, which is often much harder to prove. It's uh, certainly something that we all hope um, to see through all of our endeavors and efforts and investments. And impact tells the story of the larger effects um, that on people, society, organizations, and on those more long-term um, outcomes. So if we return to effects though, which is where I really want to focus right now, what I, um, uh, what I th what I think is that effects are those foundations to building a compelling case. They may be small and sometimes they'll have ripple effects. And here it might be really useful to adopt that ecological framing that uh, uh, Beverly was talking about in terms of your own innovation. So in any ecology, if you change one thing, it creates a tension, a push or a pull on other parts of the ecology. And from this perspective, there's a need to not only look for the intended effects, but also those domino interactions, which, you know, may not be unintended, uh, not only unintended, sorry, but also uh, possibly undesirable. So um, an example is uh, research and videos in classrooms, which is something that I've, I've been doing for a while. And we can see that there's a positive regard by teachers of video platforms that offer a great variety of high production videos. But um, the research also tells us that researchers are not always thorough in their search and they're guided by ranking of, of the search. So which videos appear on the screen first uh, and on the production quality, but not necessarily in the content accuracy. So what we, what we can sort of see is um, that there are sometimes these unintended and undesirable or unnoticed connections that's going on in any intervention and we have to sort of keep a broad perspective of looking for those effects and and uh what's causing it so in that regard videos are highly regarded there and we can often sell a case of of, of video platforms or um, multimedia production you know artifacts but if we're not really careful about what we're measuring and how we're measuring it and what what's the reasons why something has got a high regard, then we could actually be uh, sort of missing the point. The other thing about effects is they're not all uh, directly measurable. And this is something that's really important in educational research, is that not everything that we uh, are trying to have an impact on is directly measurable. And so we need to create logical and well-established proxies and we need to look for secondary effects and make it make a case for what is might what might actually be happening. And the more honest and raw we can be with with this kind of understanding that we're not always necessarily able to measure those uh, those effects directly, then it, it actually helps to build that um, that so sort of the, the integrity of a case and I think um, makes a makes the case much stronger. So your evidence becomes more compelling because um, you're revealing warts and all of what's going on. And each of these um, sort of levels of looking at evidence of, of from effects to outcomes to impact leads themselves to certain questions that you might start to ask. Now, um, one of the things that we need to do, of course, is being critical of evidence. Again, this is not a masterclass, so we're not going to go into every aspect of evidence or indeed um, start to talk about uh, data as such. But um, there are some useful prompts which I think might lead off the conversation this morning. So for instance, can you ever hope to prove your innovation resulted in improved outcomes or impacts? In education, it's particularly difficult. 
um, whether you're looking at teaching, learning or administration, there are so many variables that interact over time that it's almost impossible to account for them all. And indeed, even if you try, if you take an experimental design, you then have the, the difficult task of demonstrating how that experimental design and experimental conditions then relates to the real world messiness of education. So really, when we're talking about evaluation of education technology, we shift away from language of proof to language of supporting a case, of strengthening um, an argument through the evidence that you can bring to bear. We need to be careful of jumping to conclusions, and in particular, we have to be careful of correlations. Um, so correlations may support an argument, but we need to be careful of assuming um, uh, sort of points of um, causation. You know, and, and we, we can draw on so many different examples of spurious correlations. And here's one of my favorites, uh, which is this, this notion of taking um, uh, data, two, two data sets, putting them together, and you come up with a correlation, which then leads you to a rather erroneous conclusion. And in this case, it, it seems that per capita cheese consumption correlates with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. So clearly, if we want to reduce such horrible outcomes, we need to also reduce the amount of cheese that people eat. It's a simple conclusion based on a spurious correlation. Now, none of this is going to be new to you all in, in this room, but it's just a good reminder to us to go when we build a case, we need to also make sure it's, it's founded on very carefully constructed proxies. Another, another sort of interesting point that often comes up in these conversations is, uh, is quantitative better than qualitative? Well, um, you know, it, it, obviously the answer is a yes and a no, and it's increasingly common for evaluative research to include both in a, in a mixed methods approach, where you're drawing on the strengths of both at different particular points in your work to, to demonstrate uh, what you're trying to, um, trying to sort of de uh, evidence. Now, it depends sort of on what you're seeking to measure and the theory that you're applying. For example, in quantitative data, it can be really useful to have um, to use a quantitative approach when you have a hypothesis or a well-established understanding of the variables involved. And so you're trying to measure uh, those variables that, that um, are, are recognised and you have a reliable approach to it. Qualitative research, on the other hand, is, can be particularly powerful to explore and be generative in, in understanding what a, how a phenomenon might be working or why a phenomenon might be working. Um, you might use both in, in an interesting series of phases. So it's not an issue of quantitative better than qualitative. Obviously, there's some magic in numbers, and but we need to recognise that sometimes building a compelling case, you need to go deep, rich and thick with your data. And this leads to another interesting question, and what's observable and what's measurable, and this um, sort of speaks back to a comment that I've already made. Um, so how do we measure what can't be observed? For example, the whole thing about learning, for instance, is learning observable? Well, if you adopt uh, cognitive theories of learning, you know, which sort of a dominate, whether you're looking at social constructivist or constructivism or cognitivism, there are all, all of these understandings of learning that have a large component of processes that go inside the head. So you can't directly observe, and you know, you could look into um, different, different forms of neuroscience and different ways to measure um, brain sparks and things like that, but you can't directly observe uh, the actual process that's going on inside one's head. And from that point then, if you're going to make a claim that your innovation has an impact on learning, then we need to start to think about what, what are the observable patterns of behavior that we might use to help suggest certain kinds of learning um, approaches, you know, the study habits, test results. We might build in different ways of measuring by talking to students or learners, trying to uh, understand their process, their feelings, their effect, their, their responses in different ways. But we can't, in, in this respect, prove the learning. We establish it through a series of arguments. So, what we're going to do now is going to shift over to a um, breakout room soon. But what I want to do is take these ideas, or what I want you to do is take these ideas, and they're very brief and they're fast and, and um, they're using sort of a loose language. 
but I want you to start to think about what are the effects that you're trying to uh, um, observe or evidence or reveal um, through your innovation? What are the effects that you're hoping to occur? What are the effects that might occur as a ripple or a domino interaction? How are you going to measure those? And this is where we want you to focus your conversation with each other. Now, as you move into those groups, you won't have um, interacted with each other before. Well, it's unlikely that you will have um, done so. So what we want you to do is introduce yourselves, take a moment to introduce yourselves and, and introduce the innovative enterprise that you're engaging in. Then talk about what the positive change you're hoping to achieve and how you're going to evidence that. What's the effects you're looking for? How do you know that this is a compelling story? So um, I think, Sarah, you've got the link to um, how, well, ex explanation of how to do this, or David? Yeah, I think that's my job. I think that I'm, I've got a sheet here that tells me how to tell people how to do what you're asking them to do. So before we jump to that, I think it's really interesting. And the thing that I take away from what you've just given is an introduction to, Michael, is this idea of effect and the effect you're trying to achieve. And I, I, I think about that a lot because we, we build ed tech solutions and we deploy ed tech solutions and sometimes we just need to go back to that first principle of saying who are we trying to affect and what are we trying to achieve with them. I think it's a really fundamental thing. So it is now time for us to move to go and have a group discussion. We were having a great conversation. I didn't want to come back, actually. Sorry, I got I got, got drawn out. So um, I'm not sure how we want to wrap up that component and then have a break. I'm, I'm in your hands. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, David. Um, uh, one of the one of the interesting things is we've been using the Padlet to to keep a finger on the pulse just to see some of the thoughts that have been coming through, and. Um, I think uh, we, we might react to a couple of those before we go into um, a, a short break. So one of the things I noticed was, was some really interesting comments about um, the nature of evidence, um, about it being potentially inferred or, or um, whether you can directly measure something. Um, and also the, the kind of understanding that um, effects can be part of a process and that you might be about measuring the way in which something occurs over time through participants, with participants, uh, with various stakeholders. And that's something that I know Margaret's going to be talking about um, in the next session when we look at notions of efficacy. But what I thought I might do is just come back a little bit to um, the nature of, of the evidence or the data and two concepts, which are validity and reliability, and they're sometimes really useful to help us uh, test our notions of the compelling nature of, of our evidence. Um, Sarah, I might ask you if you could share uh, my screen. Um, uh, I had, had a few um, thoughts and screens that I had prepared just in case some things came up through the Padlet, and I think this one might be particularly relevant. So. When we consider the nature of evidence, um, those researchers in the room are going to be very comfortable with notions of reliability and validity. But um, here, what I just wanted to do is for, for everyone's sort of benefit is just to provoke the idea around reliability. And that's the notion of, will you get the same results if you test it again at a different time with different people in a different context? How reliable is your process? Leave them there if evidence? they want to stay there, that's fine. Um, so an example, of course, is, is the, the notion of multimedia learning. Uh, again, so coming back to some of the research I've done around uh, video designs that support learning. So many experimental designs, for instance, show that um, there is success in terms of videos uh, helping learning. However, the, there's a lack of empirical studies that also explore issues of transference. That's the rec replicability in other contexts, such as real life classrooms. So therefore the reliability of the measures, they're, they're so sort of reliable on one hand in that you can do those experiments again and again, and you can get sort of similar results. But when you take it to a different context, it, it becomes harder to, um, to come up with those same results because other variables are at play. And so that, that notion of reliability then is a really powerful notion to help evidence um, those, those uh, outcomes that you, you want and to, to reveal that there are potentially a large degree of other variables is sometimes a very powerful approach in, in demonstrating a kind of authenticity and 
honesty in how you're uh, demonstrating your innovation. The notion of validity, uh, in contrast, though, is really this idea of does does this thing that you're doing measure report upon the phenomenon that it claims? And this is one of the problems that I often come across. And that's sort of the notion that sometimes you make claims that goes much broader than, than what you're uh, really looking at. So an example there, for instance, again, in, if we take videos in, in education, um, experimental designs have been used to argue that video is good for learning, okay, as I've said before. But the dominant approach that these um, uh, uh, empirical studies have, have taken is that they've adopted a cognitivist theory of uh, learning, which is essentially focused on memory or replication of, of a sort of a, a fact from one video and being able to replicate it or, <clears throat> you know, repeat it. But it doesn't account for things like emotion, motivation, metacognition, let alone translation of memory into new insights or learning. So building upon that memory. So when these designs are for measuring the outcome, the learning outcome, um, they're, they're really limited to a perspective that they're really just measuring memory. But so the strength of validity is weakened when there's claims that videos are great for learning. Because of course, uh, they're not taking the broader understanding of learning. And so when you play with notions of reliability and validity in this context, I think it can be really powerful in strengthening um, your your claims. So Margaret, was were there any other ideas from the Padlet that, that you wanted to Spartan. Sure. So something that really struck me, and you're talking about validity and reliability here, is someone commented that the Australian market has higher standards than other countries, and it does, and 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 use of the term measurement. And look, th th there are, there is also the issue, I think, of claims versus what you're trying to achieve. So we work in research land, and I know that in our world, issues of validity and reliability are incredibly important the i mean sorry to use the obvious example at the moment if you've got a vaccine and you want to put it in your arm you need to know that it is absolutely going to do what it's going to do and it's not going to have any bad side effects and etc so there are very very high standards for things that are particularly high stakes in this world of ed tech things are a little bit more um uh loose but what i guess my argument would be is that if this data is about helping the product as well. So it's also about um, not only building a claim, but a claim to yourself so that you you will know that when when you when you put your product out there or you will have a degree of confidence that when you put your product out there, that it's going to do um, it's going to do what you think it's going to do and it's going to delight the people who are using it if if you know if it's a delightful sort of thing or if it you know it will it will it will do what it's supposed to do so it's also a claim for yourself i guess in terms of standards and there's and so you've got to think about some of um some of uh not only you making a claim but who's the claim for i guess in a nutshell Fantastic. I, I agree. And there was the, um, and that, that ties in with that last comment on the Padlet, I think, which is a really powerful and critical view is, is this a notion that the, the research land might not have the same view as your evidence as the non-research land reader. Absolutely. So, um, so there is always that tension of finding what evidence is compelling. And here what we're trying to do is if you've got claims about learning or other kinds of um, outcomes, what are the effects that support that? And I think the the compelling nature then there is is demonstrating that your product or service is having the outcome that you're or is actually leading to the outcome. I think there is a difference, however, when we talk about say having evidence or a compelling case to market to to sell a product and to to whom within that. So you have, for instance, in any in a educational platform, you might have student, you might have teacher, you might have leader principle, um, purchase, you know, etc. And there's different kinds of evidence that you would use. Here, we're about 
ensuring that the data or the evidence is is reliable and, and strong and absolutely there is a certain degree of cr critique we can bring to the way in which researchers might talk about what uh, makes something strong so absolutely we're open for that that debate as well um what we might be doing now i think is moving into a short break uh david do you have any instructions about that yeah i do we're going to have a break for 10 minutes but i i thought what i might just do is quickly um Two things that I sort of noted, I, I like research land, I'm going to use that now forever. I like the idea that research land made you think differently to the non-research land world. Um, the other one, which was target audience or the reader and the, 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 the audience that you're trying to address. And certainly in our breakout room, we had a lot of conversation about direct evidence versus inferred evidence versus implied. And there was a whole bunch of conversation, which I suspect we'll take up in the next session, which is around efficacy, because we start talking about the group was very much interested in this idea of is it the student the teacher because it was a k-12 room was a student the teacher the administrator the principal the department of education who were the who who was reviewing this and i think that's really interesting stuff as well uh we now move into our next component which i think is now we're going to start talking about efficacy and we're going to spend some time and i think margaret and michael are going to again do the same thing give us an introduction to efficacy and then it will allow us to go into breakout rooms and think about that as well so i'll hand over to you margaret hi i think um i'm picking up the talking in in this one a little bit more um but hopefully it will segue very nicely on um, from the previous topic. And Michael, of course, please feel free to jump in with any thoughts at any time. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen now. Um, so um, what I would like to start with is, once again, talking about efficacy in this in this triad lay out the agenda 10 minutes maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less um 20 minutes um uh, what i'd really it'd be great if having done this once round um if you pop up those discussion points on padlet and you can review what other people are talking about as well too so the useful thing about padlet is it helps you know what's not only what's going on in your room what's going on more broadly and then we'll use padlet to prompt that final discussion. I want to sort of segue a little bit from where we were before, from research land to evaluation land. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about evaluation is I think it's um, really something that um, when you look at seeing how well a particular product is doing in a particular time and place, that really sits under the evaluation tag very well as 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 and somewhat under the research tag but very nicely under the evaluation tag you'll notice michael talked about investigating a phenomenon that is absolute research land language we're interested in as researchers as you know um how video works in general video as um the broad topic not a specific implementation of it the specific implementation sits well within evaluation now things can be both and it's a little bit messy, but I wanted to bring, or we wanted to bring you to the point of thinking about evaluation because uh, we think it's the language that will be most helpful. So there are many sorts of evaluations. Here are just three. There's process evaluation, which describes how project has been implemented. It really looks at what you did along the way. There's outcome evaluation. You've talked a little bit about that before, what change has occurred relative to the um, outcomes and then that impact evaluation so and there are all sorts of different forms of evaluation as well too not going not going into those today just to bring bring these as ideas prompters to help you think about this notion of efficacy because what we really want to focus on today is process and outcome we think process is really important and people overlook it um, and and I guess this particular um, series of workshops, and this as well as this one in particular, is really seeking to help you enrich um, what you do. So how you identify, gather, interpret evidence, and thus demonstrate this notion of efficacy. 
And we'd also suggest that if you if you go to evaluators and you can have an evaluation lens, you can also see evaluators as critical friends, um, people who often different offer different perspectives and work alongside um, the team, both the educators um, and the um, ed tech providers, the innovation team, prompting ways to demonstrate efficacy. So um, this is a simple framework that we would like to present to prompt your thinking about what you're doing. We're saying there are four facets of efficacy and we're going to um, talk to them one by one and then get you in the breakout rooms to think about them. The first one is process. So as I said before, outcomes are not the only measure of success. Data needs to be collected about process. And it's most important to do that because particularly as you can respond to it as well. So if you collect data as you're going, a formative form of evaluation, you can, you can adjust what you're doing. And rapid prototyping is a perfect example of something I think everyone would be familiar with of that sort of process-based. Um, and in some ways you say, well, I did rapid proto prototyping. So not only did it inform what I did, but it's a marker that the sorts of things I'm going to be doing, uh, the processes I'm undertaking are probably strong ones. Um, and I draw here, and I'm going to give quite a few examples. They're mostly drawn from the learning side of things. I know some of your, some of the ed tech is not always about learning. It's often about administration. It's about all sorts of other um, ways to help um, education. But I think it's fair to say both Michael and my background are in are in learning. So that's that's where our examples tend to focus. So in an ed tech that's seeking to improve learning. The sorts of process questions you might ask is, how does this ed tech draw from learning theory? You know a lot about how learning occurs. How does this product uh, work and sit within that? How does it align with good educational practices? And notice the word good. Sometimes what you see, um, well, you know, the reality is, is what often happens on the floor of a classroom or in a virtual space may not be um, optimal or um, um, learning theory um, aligned educational practice. So it's also about seeing how does this align with uh, with quality practices and also how does it assure, ensure that what you're providing is ethical with respect to learners and teachers. Now that might seem, um, ethics might seem a little bit, um, uh, what's the word, um, vague or something that's not relevant, but it's highly, I, I, increasingly I see it being highly relevant. And here's an example of something that I've certainly seen. An analytics application forms teachers and students, they say, right, we've crunched all the data and we can predict, we can tell when a student is predicted to fail to 95% accuracy based on the grades, how they've performed on their first three assignments. This has a lot of problems with it. Um, one, not the least of which is a literature report that one of the big predictors of educational performance is what students and teachers expect. So um, even before you get off the marks to start thinking about outcomes, a process oriented evaluation would say, hang on, we can see that there are going to be ethical problems here. We're going to bring in an intervention that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy and a range of other concerns as well too. Um, really important to remember. So that's process. The next one we talked about was intended outcome. We've spent a bit of time talking about that and certainly most energy is spent on outcomes. And as you know, as, as Michael, we talked about last time, measurement is difficult, qualitative data is not always generalizable, there are unintended effects. Sometimes it's not clear what was intended in the first place. In other words, it's, it's complicated. And I wanted to introduce um, some real world kind of discussion here, because here we've got this lovely idea, specific and measurable effects, often short term in relation to predefined objectives. And outcomes tell us the changes has occurred as a result of a planned intervention. It seems so sweet. But the reality is, is that it's not always that easy. Here's something, here's a piece of evaluation that I was involved in from Deakin. Um, they use the FutureLearn platform to um, 
to host degrees, used an innovative educational design matched with this with the with the MOOCs um, platform. A lot of data, um, great great on attrition. So less students who enrolled in these um, degrees um, withdrew relative to versions beforehand. Grades and unit satisfactions remain the same. Um, and then the qualitative data revealed contradictions. So we had a lot of back and forth. So things that looked um, qualitatively great to some people were qualitatively extremely difficult for others. Um, so it enabled some things and really challenged others. And while retention rates went up, as we said, there were other, other issues at hand and we had no, no means of testing this hypothesis, but one of, one of our um, guesses is that this approach actually enabled certain types of learners and we would, were suggesting um, learners who needed a lot of support, who needed a lot of scaffolding, but didn't help others and in fact, possibly annoyed them. So um, I wanted to show this data to say that intended outcomes, even if you've got some ideas about them, the sort of data you get back can be really um, contradictory. Outcomes are not always clear. Very easy, intended outcomes, very easy to write, sometimes very difficult to um, uh, achieve in terms of measurement. So I've talked a lot about that. That's the evidence sort of side of things that we were talking about before. Here's another something that we often collect evidence about, acceptability, whether users like an intervention. It's not the same as whether it's effective. Like students might not like using an intervention, although it works. And this is really about usability, enjoyability, and often what we call satisfaction and user response. But for those of us who are interested in learning, this does not equate to learning. But it's really important. So here's a support app example. Um, it's it, This is a little bit fictional, but I've seen sem plenty of things that are similar. A support app which nudges the students about their assessments make a makes a huge difference to pass rates in a small study. But in practice, students find it irritating or ignore it or don't download it. Although if they were to use the app, it would likely improve their grades. So this is kind of this notion that user satisfaction is this real gatekeeper into other things. If people don't like it, they're not going to use it. But if they were to use it, it might be effective. And often we find that acceptability is the sort of like the threshold level to which people um, tend to come. It's, 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 it's a very sort of product oriented. How much did you like it? But particularly with learning, it's certainly not the end of the story. And finally, feasibility. Feasibility takes into account the cost, resources, and timing of it, the time taken of the intervention. If it's too ex expensive, it's going to affect this success. And when I say expensive, it's not just cost of resource, it's also educator cost or student cost. How much effort is required? How much dollars, how much time to get this thing happening? Um, and it's actually a really important part of efficacy. And I think probably from a product produ production point of view, it's not um, so unusual, but from an educational institution point of view, often this is not looked at as strongly, but it's critical, of course. So I guess this is our um, uh, proposition to you that efficacy equals the process, the right amount of process, of, um, versus uh, times the um, intended outcome, times the acceptability, times the feasibility. And the reason we put it in an equation like this is a couple of things. One, they have a multiplier effect. So if you have better results in any of these, it makes the whole thing more efficacious, if you like. So for example, you can, you if you have, if it's a very low cost product, you can see suddenly everything else starts to boost as well too. The, the, the whole equation becomes um, a bigger, has a, a better outcome. Um, I will come to that in the next part. I've got a question here. Um, and I just wanted to comment to that is that, we'll come to that in interpretation. 
Um, the um, other thing that's happening here is that if any one of these is zero, that is to say, process is poor, intended outcomes aren't met, acceptability is not good or cost is not acceptable, then the efficacy actually goes to zero. All of these facets are required to, to make something efficacious. So now we go back over to you. And uh, um, in the next session, we're going to talk about um, in, in interpretation, we're going to talk about audience and so on. And this one, what we'd like you to talk about, although please feel welcome to talk about audience, what would, from your perspective, indicate successful processes, intended outcomes? You've talked about this already, acceptability and feasibility. And which of these is most challenging to you and why? And um, we hope that that's what you'll talk about now in the breakout rooms. But I'll hand over for a quick chat to. Um, Michael and uh, David to see if there's anything they want to add. I'll leave it for you, Michael, if you want to add something. No, 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 absolutely fine. Th thanks, Margaret, for that. It's it. I, I, the whole notion of this formula is such is such a powerful one, isn't it? This idea that if something just isn't feasible, then it has such a, a significant impact on the rest of the formula. So we need to understand all of it. But, um, but it's also always very contextually contingent. We, we were having a, a really deep conversation about implementing process, pre-qualification of whether or not the, the user has the readiness, and we were thinking about readiness. So this sort of really interesting conversation. Let's welcome back Michael and Mark who can bring us back to think about what happened in those rooms. And I see that Padlet's got lots and lots of content in it. Yeah, such a fascinating discussion. And thanks for filling up the Padlet. I thought I would really just talk to some of the things that were raised there. And, um, and uh, what I might even ask you to do is, if you want to, um, uh, keep that Padlet going. I'll try and keep an eye on it as well for um, for uh, your comments, because it'd be great to hear back from you. And Padlet will probably do just as well as anything else um, to see what you're, how you're responding to some of the ideas I'm raising. And please review the Padlet, because it's there for everyone to, to have a sense. The big message that I would take out of the first couple of comments is that I would be thinking about the um, the um, equation as a metaphor rather than as an equation. So um, it's a metaphor about multipliers and multiplying effects. You know, when something is, um, is, is present, it multiplies everything else. And when something's absent, and in fact, it's zero, it, it, it reduces the prospect on, to, to, to something that's problematic. So that's really the main point here. I'm, um, I wouldn't want to claim that it was actually a mathematical equation. Um, and um, when you think of it in those terms, I think it, it becomes, you, you get a bit of looseness about it. So, you know, you can say, well, what timeline will this take over? Um, I need to think about byproduct effects and etc. Because even though they're not in the equation or it's not spelt out in the equation, if it, if you think of it more metaphorically, then then you, you you'll find it'll flex and bend a little bit to your to your needs. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add on that? Or no, I, th I think that's a that's a really good way to think about it. In fact, so that that dovetails nicely with, for instance, even the first point in the Padlet, which was around the notion that a structured implementation over time can can itself be a the sort of a multiplying effect of trustworthiness of product because it's you're you're, you're demonstrating this kind of curiosity and criticality around your own product or service. Um, so I think and and that constantly evolving development of product or service. So. Um, I think it's a, it's a good way to think about things. So thank you. And um, yeah, I think that's a really nice way to kind of address that, that comment. The other thing that I, um, and I'm obviously coming to the, the issue as well, I was trying to make reference to that unintended outcomes, which we'll come back to a little bit more in the next session. I, 
I, I thought a few comments came around this sort of idea that key people needed to find things um, acceptable. And um, I think that um, um, this comes to the notion of subjective nature of the claim. We come to this a little bit more, but I think I'd re-emphasise this again. Any form of efficacy, any form of evidence is about working with people in the model that we're proposing. This is not something that is um, just um, done solo. You work with people and, and because what is feasible to one person isn't feasible to another, what's acceptable to one person isn't acceptable to another. So this sort of constant engagement, I think, is when collecting evidence and data is really important. A couple of other really quick points, because I know we've got another break coming up. Um, People talked about readiness. Now, in evaluation terms, that's often for, referred to as context or presage. We didn't put this in here, um, but it's often a way of saying, what are the factors in my environment that will make this stick? Um, I, I think that it is um, often not something that people have a great deal of control over. I, I, I think that readiness is, you can also read readiness as saying, it'll work for this context, but not for this context. But um, if that's the case, then you, you need to think about where, where you're putting things. And again, we'll come to that next. I, I, I think it's interesting to shift from, um, Readiness as well as implies that there's something that will necessarily be achieved. And I would I would argue that that can be really useful. And you see that a lot in ordinary uptake of tech. Um, but it's also worth keeping your ear out. Sometimes people will never be ready as well. So you have may have to bring them with you. I mean, we see this with um, we've, we, we, we see this a lot. So Really important point. Think about readiness. Think about the context in which you're going to. Um, there's a bit of discussion about quantum qual um, as well and how difficult qual is to make proofs. I just want to make the point some things are very easy to measure. Just because it's easy to measure, sometimes that means it's what we do measure and it's the products that we get. So I think it's really worth having the hard conversation that just because something's easy to measure doesn't mean that it's the only thing that's valuable. I work in clinical education a lot. I can tell you right now, it's really easy to measure. If someone's stitching someone up, if someone's sticking a tube down someone's throat, they're really, well, it's really, sorry, that's not, if they're intubating someone correctly, that is that is really easy to measure. Things like communication skills, trustworthiness of care, they're hard, doesn't mean they're not important. So. I think sometimes it's a bit of argument. And we finally asked for a worked example, someone uh, yeah. writing, writing up. Um, I had, Michael, did you, does that mean oh, you've got I, one under I, your fingertips? I, I think um, actually th this reminded me of coming back to this notion of this, this framing of efficacy as a, as a metaphor. So there is no intention at all of quantifying these things where you might end up, for instance, with an FEC score of 120 or 20 or something. There's no intention there. It's just the notion that, that um, in understanding efficacy, it's not simply about, for instance, dollars or, or numbers of bums on seat or something like this. It's, it's this interaction between um, those four elements. And that's how we're trying to be playful and broaden out um, the conceptions of how something can be judged to be efficacious. Um, and so, so really going to speak strongly against offering a worked formula that, that might suggest a numeric outcome or that one company is more efficacious than another company based on some sort of um, objective um, sort of outcome there. This is all within your own context. Indeed. And each of the examples I gave, aside from the outcome ones, I think gave it gave an idea of when if where where there was a problem. So they each actually talk to that element of the formula. The predictive analytics, which was really was problematic ethically, um, the outcomes which was complex, the um the app which wasn't 
users wouldn't use and then just generalised. I just went for a generalised sort of cost or time. So all of those elements provide those, I think, are examples of, um, of elements of the formula. And you can imagine all the other bits are as good as you like, but they're, 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 the, they're the points of focus. Break time? Yeah, I think so. So um, as a little wrap up, I think that we're getting a really good sort of structured process here, thinking about what evidence we can collect and now starting to think about how do we measure that as a, having an impact. And I think the, 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 the rubber hit the road in the next session where we start talking about interpretation, right, where we start saying, well, how do we interpret that and who's the audience and start thinking about these things. I'll um, welcome Margaret and Michael back and we can kick off the final piece, which I think from the top of my head is interpretation. Great, thanks so much. And yes, it is interpretation and um, I will share the stream. Um, oh, I was scaring my, sh sharing my screen. There we go. Or um, scaring even. Scaring, scaring the stream. <laughs> Oh, I'm losing my words. Um, so exactly as David said, this last block is about interpretation and um, very straightforward. Uh, 10 minutes, talk about interpretation, um, 20 minutes, the discussion and um, uh, five minutes quick uh, report back and then we might conclude the workshop overall and we might finish that up a little bit early which will leave you more time for the next session. We'll see how we go, see how um, much talk chat there is um, in the groups and in the Padlet. So the whole point about interpretation is that it is everything. Um, generally speaking, a um, data point does not speak for itself. Um, likewise, uh, you know, almost any piece of information about something needs to be understood within its context. So choices must be made about what data mean and within which particular context. And people are talking a lot about different contexts and, and, and this is exactly right. I mean, we all know intuitively that things do work differently um, across across locations for different people um, and etc. So I really like um, what's called the realist, the realist approach. It's by a guy called Ray Pawson and he has his tagline, what works for whom and under what circumstances. Now Pawson is, and as as um, I think I've alluded to before, I have a background in health. Um, in health inter interventions, we see this absolutely radically. Um, something that works in one place will not work in another. Um, and um, something that works for an adult will not work for a child. Something that works for one population just just won't. And in fact, it might vary from time of year or it's and etc. So thinking about answering this question, what works for whom and under what circumstances is a really useful kind of um, guiding question. And every single aspect of evaluation involves some degree of interpretation. One of the reasons I put this up there is there's is it often an idea that some forms of data are more interpretive than others. You know, qualitative data is highly subjective. But I would argue that even the very basics of quantitative data require some degree of interpretation. So I do this a bit collect enrolment data to describe retention rates in higher education. It seems straightforward. The proportion of students enrolled at the beginning of the course compared to those involved enrolled at the end. But what do we mean by the beginning? Is it the beginning of semester? Is it two weeks after semester ends? Is it after the census date? And for people who work in schools, you may not know that, you know, on the 30th of um, 30th of March or thereabouts, um, the government says we, you can't withdraw without you cannot withdraw without penalty at that point, but prior to that, it doesn't cost anything to withdraw. So it's a huge marker of dropout rate. And when do the students encounter the EdTech product? If they only encounter it at the very end, retention rates aren't really going to be meaningful. So even this very simple piece of data involves a high degree interpreta of interpretation in setting up. And then once results are in our reading, what does this mean? 
that's let alone the other more complex um, interpretive moves that need to be made. So this is one of the reasons that we can't cling too closely to the formulas as being numerical or being, you know, things that you can tick off on. They're very um, context specific. And I'll, even this notion, these notions we're talking about are context specific. I noticed someone put up in the Padlet before um, um, a, a sort of a, a brochure and they're talking about um, a data from California. Now, what nations national emphasis is on the sorts of evidence that they like is quite variant. So North Americans love their measurement. They absolutely adore it. But um, Europeans don't tend to like it so much. And we in Australia sit in the middle. So you also need to think about the differences between nations as well. And I guess this is really the key message. Data always depends on context. And, you know, and I put up this slide because, you know, it's New York, New York skyline. For those of us who are old enough, this is a New York skyline that we grew up with. For those of you who are younger, you, you won't, you know, the Twin Towers won't be a familiar tag to you at all. And so even these very um, simple notions of what seems um, unchanging can actually change quite considerably and upon your perspective. So um, I'm going to give an example and the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make here again, I think we would emphasize this again and again, is this isn't about ticking boxes. This isn't going to be about collecting data that proves stuff. It's complicated. This is an example of pilot educational technology trial. I'm not gonna say you know, necessarily what it is, but it's a product designed to enhance learning. So great co-design process, you know, lots of ethical ticks, lots of rapid prototyping, tick, tick, tick. It's resource and cost efficient and the teachers love it. It makes their life easier. The students quite like it. It doesn't really make a difference to the performance or retention. And educational specialists say, well, hang on, this helps with the instrumental aspects of the task. Like make the task easier, but we're not sure it helps with learning. So based on our previous sort of um, view of the world, you know, the acceptability is really high. It's unclear if the intended learning outcome is met, but it may have other benefits. So this is why, back to that question again in the Padlet, what happens if there are other, if the intended outcome isn't right, but there are other things that it's doing? Can you reset the formula? Well, of course you can. But I do think it's important to make nod to the fact internally, you don't have to blast it as a claim to the world, that perhaps for this particular purpose, um, it wasn't working the way you thought it might be. And so then you have to again go back to the drawing board and start to make these interpretations. It's a, it's a guess. The guess is that the product is having good result for teachers, but not for learning. It's really helping them. So then what happens next? Does the product get redeveloped? Do you change the focus um, to, to, to product get redeveloped to focus on, to return to the learning focus, to try and meet those intended outcomes? Or does the focus get changed? And then you go into another cycle of trying to collect efficacy data on teacher time saving, or looking at that as a measure of your primary outcome. But as you can see, in the evaluation space, this is really about building a picture of, of, of evidence, of efficacy that is interpretive. We are not going to be in the business of um, those sorts of drug trials, which are very biological, where we know that it's very concrete x plus y equals z even that's very subject to interpretation so don't get me wrong but it's more concrete but we're in the business of doing things that are often involving people context and measurement is hard so the other key point that we have to do is um to talk about is that that the interpretation needs multiple perspectives. It's best to interpret with others. You can get really stuck seeing your perspective. Getting a group of people in the room is really useful to look at that data. Key point, 
Efficacy or not efficacy is rarely binary. And the last thing I really want to talk about and raise to you is that sometimes you, all your interpretations, everything to one side, you just go, right, this is not working. And I'd really like to say, as a point of view of someone who's been involved in watching things fail, it's always better to know that early and to see that as a good sign. Um, it, it's very hard, it's very bitter at the time, but it is always better than to look back in hindsight and say, well, we actually kind of guessed that a year or two ago, but we went ahead down the track. Bad news is often good news. It's a sign to say, stop, let's, let's not expend any more effort or money. So that's some, some, and that last point, I don't know how provocative it is, but there's a series of provocations for you. So consider your um, products, ed techs you've been involved with, either as a developer, user, however you like, could be something you've seen in the past, doesn't have to be your product. Um, what interpretations did you make about its efficacy at the time and why? What were the limitations surrounding these interpretations? And how did you work with others? And a bit of a tag to how do you work with partners into the future when interpreting evidence around efficacy? And um, I think we're going to switch over to the, um, to the group discussion now. Oh, I didn't realise I was back on screen. I was still thinking about what the next part of it is. Thanks very much, Mark. Yeah, we are. We are going to move to the group discussion. So this is the final thing. Jump into the participate room. Have a conversation with your colleagues about those questions that Mark put up there, which is um, considering a previous EdTech product you've been involved with either as a developer or user, what interpre interpretation did you make at the time? In hindsight, were there limitations surrounding these interpretations and why and how did you work with others? All right, we'll see you in the um, participate rooms. Thanks very much, guys. We had a great conversation in our room. We were talking a little bit really deeply about some of the things that you made us think about, which was around the evidence that we're collecting, the interpretation, what if what if success is in one environment within the same customer, is the evidence impacting, you know, if you've got a cohort of students, then how does that impact the others? And really interesting conversation, but I'll hand back over to you. Thanks so much, David. And um, just really, we're just um, wanting to wrap up the whole thing with a very quick reminder of the sorts of places we've been I'll just I'll just put the sh the final slide up um, really I mean I think that what we were aiming to talk about was um, evidence evidence efficacy and interpretation and really this sort of idea to take to this point I think someone put in the padlet it's not a binary almost none of this is a binary it's complex it's um, it's interpreted and it's multiple, the multiple perspectives, multiple things going on. Um, Michael, did you have any final words you'd like to say? No, I think I think the whole uh, goal of these three workshops has been to be has been meant to be a playful exploration of potentially developing new insights. It's uh, recognizing that that the way in which we evidence and a compelling story of why a product or service is successful. It comes from multiple sources of data. It might be for different audiences at the same time. Um, and I think, I think it's that kind of um, broad approach that for me is, is, is part of that compelling case to, to recognize that there are no binaries and to, to reveal the, the strengths as well as the, uh, the weaknesses of something is is to show its ongoing potential. Well, thank you, and I guess that's a great point for us to finish. And thank you so much for participating. We we really um, we really appreciated um, your contributions. Margaret and Michael, thank you so very much for taking us on a framework of what efficacy could be in in the realms of what we're trying to achieve for both edtech and entrepreneurs and companies and also the educators that have participated today it gives us a really usable framework because efficacy is one of those terms that i think we bandy about a lot 
and we don't stop and think about what they might be. And I, I asked a couple of the people in the room that I was at to sort of wrap up for me to give me some insight as to the things that they've taken away from it. And there are three broad comments from the group that I think I'll share with you and with everyone else, because I think it gives you an insight that you've actually hit the, the mark of what we were trying to achieve. So the very first one is that it, it's reminded some of these entrepreneurs, because they were all entrepreneurs in the room I was in, that they've got an enormous amount of data and evidence in their business that they can actually now stop and think back and go, well, wait a sec, how do I use that data in a systematic, consistent model that will allow me to drive the commercial outcomes that I'm seeking by focusing on using that data to inform the customer and also the users. So that's an incredibly important piece. The, the other one, which I, I think, or the next one, which I think is um, really important, which is it, it broadens and has stopped these entrepreneurs and given them time to think about, well, what actually do we mean by evidence? Because we've had this narrow interpretation of evidence, but you've actually given people the the freedom to go well wait a sec no no we can interpret evidence in a different way as long as we make sure the context is right the feasibility of it the accessibility and all of these other factors that are laying into this idea of what efficacy is so i, I think if those two are enough that's that, that if those two are achieved then that's enough from the workshop but i think the final piece which i'll leave you leave you with is it's given them a really good understanding of how we are thinking about efficacy in the context of the EdTech Innovation Alliance program. And I think it gives us an opportunity, if I circle back to where um, Professor Beverly Oliver started, which was this idea of no one part, the component of these stakeholders of this ecosystem do it individually. And by having Global Victoria and the Victorian government supporting initiative that drives connection, supported by um, uh, oversight is such an important thing and I'm really looking forward to what comes out of it. So Marg, Michael, thank you so very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Again, I'll thank Margaret Beerman and Michael Henderson from Deacon and Monash respectively for a really interesting workshop. I also want to thank the Victorian government for their support of this program, making it a priority for the government and supporting the Victorian EdTech ecosystem through programs like this. And quite generally, we cannot wait to see some amazing submissions and the projects that you are thinking about. So good luck with your application. Thank you very much.